you guys ready to have some fun? We're ready. Oh yeah. We, I think that everybody in here has a college fetish. <laughs> I, I agree, same. Um. <laughs> Today we're your professors. Assistant professors. Well, thank you guys for doing this as professors and dudes. Um, I want you to take me all the way back just to start because watching your documentary, which everyone should watch, by the way, um, you guys really talk about how like you were in completely different friend circles. So tell me about how you met and like how this even happened. Um, yeah, my dad bought a house uh, in 1989, around the corner from where Dan's folks lived, and Dan lived. And so um, I met him that summer, riding my bike around the neighborhood with my brothers. And uh, I met him probably the first day he was hanging with a whole circle of, of kids, and um, you know, we went like it was like it was, just, it was 1989, but it probably it felt like 1962, probably. It was really like trading baseball cards and playing stickball and um, getting harassed by the same dude that was like two feet taller than he should be at the at 13 years old or whatever. Um, but that's how we met. And the thing is, is yeah, Dan was a year older, and he was hanging with uh, you know at that age, you know being in sixth grade versus fifth grade or whatever, it's like a big difference. And um, so we ran in a different circle, but our brothers were the same age. So our brothers hung out all the time. And uh, eventually when we were teenagers, they, they, they kept suggesting we get together and play music together. So uh, one day Dan, um, I didn't even know Dan played music. He didn't know I played music. He came to my house with his guitar and an amp and he plugged in and he started playing, and uh, he started doing all these like, you know, pretty crazy blues riffs that n none of my other friends were capable of doing. And I was listening to that kind of music and getting made fun of by my friends for listening to it, like Captain Beefheart and stuff. And we, um, the minute he started playing, I, I knew I couldn't play guitar like that, so I just sat down behind the drums and uh, I had this four track recorder and we just, I showed him how it worked and we just started recording bullshit, and uh, that's basically what we still do. And you know, you guys grew up in Akron, and your new album is literally called Ohio Players. Um, what is it about this tiny town that has such great bands like Devo and you guys? Like, what is it about that place? You know, people always ask, like, what's the, what's the musical, what's the sound of Akron? And uh, there, I, I mean, I. I think there's a period in the late 70s where there's some bands that are kind of into the same sort of thing, I guess. But really, I think it's just a town where there's not much to do and the weather is horrible. Yeah. So it's like you either you either get into like video games or playing music or watching wrestling. I don't know. <laughs> do you guys think you would have been a different band anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, I think if we grew up somewhere where you could like go surfing or something, um, or like, I don't know. And are you guys fans of Devo? I mean, you're obviously have different music, but you both push boundaries similarly. It's it's the same place. Like, what is that like for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I was I am a massive Devo fan, but as a as a teenager, especially, um, they were hugely influential to me, and not necessarily musically. I mean, I love their music, but it was. My dad had um, my dad had given me this this Ryko disc release called Devo Live: The Mongoloid Years, and um, it's all these live recordings from before they got signed to Warner. But the, the the thing that was crazy influential to me was the 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 liner notes. You know, were like 20 pages long, and it told the story of them forming the band, and then them you know, being from Akron and driving to New York City to play Max's Kansas City. And like, that was like their first New York show and David Bowie was there and Andy Warhol was there and they drive back all night and then they, you know, have a have all these record deal offers. And so like, as a kid, I remember reading this and just being like, okay, like it's possible to be from Akron and like something like that happen. I mean, we ended up going to New York, doing our first show Andy Warhol wasn't there, but a ska band was, and about 30 other people on a Monday night. <clears throat> and we drove home and the phone didn't ring. Um, but it was close, the story was very similar. <laughs>
it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, speaking of these early shows, can you describe for everyone what they were like? I mean, it's, it's really over 20 years ago now. Like, when you think about those years, what do you first think of? Mm, the first show that we ever played, I think we both simultaneously blacked out. We, we had about 30 minutes of music, and they asked us to play 30 minutes. And we played our 30 minutes of music in like 15 minutes. <laughs> that was our first show at the Beachland. Um, the Beachland Tavern. Yeah, Mark and Cindy had us on a show there. Uh, we played with the band The Shams. But um, we, we had no idea what had happened after we got off stage. And, um, th but they asked us to come back a couple weeks later. Yeah, the first the first you know few months of playing shows was it was it was really exciting because you would like you would go we play like you know I don't know we were playing kind of we were playing like Toledo and Detroit and Chicago and it, it was just like random if people would show up it would all it was all dependent because it's pretty social media it's just it was dependent on whether like the the Free Weekly had written like a, a blurb you know and like. We did this tour where we had this. It was he was like a um, mercenary booking agent. Um, he was like the French Legion of booking agents or whatever French Foreign Legion. He, he would like book a show. He'd book a tour for anybody if you gave him five hundred bucks. So our our our, a, our first label alive gave him five hundred bucks and he booked us this tour, and um, it was like the most psycho routing. Um, but we had you know we had nothing going on. Like it was our only option. <clears throat> was to do this tour. There was no publicist. There was no. There's nothing going on. So it was like, everyone. Our label, Patrick at Alive, was like, you got to do this tour if you want to be, if you want to have give yourself a chance of it working out. So. We uh, we mowed lawns, together, saved, a couple hundred bucks, and we got in the van. Mowed lawns in the hood. In the hood. Most of the job is you got to move the forty bottles out of the yard. It was it, mow. mowing wasn't really accurate. It was weed whacking around forty ounce bottles, um, and dust. You were mostly mowing dust, and dirt. Yeah, it was kind of insane. And the uh, van just stunk like gas and lawn clippings. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we we went on this tour in a minivan with my brother, and um, uh, you know it was pretty rough. We were sleeping in the van. We had no money. But we finally, you know, on like the fifth day, we get to Seattle, and we play a place called Chop Suey, and um, like 250 people showed up to see us because there was a blurb in the Stranger or Seattle Weekly, and I just I remember being so stoked. Like we made a 500 bucks, and um, I slept in the van that night uh, to guard the money. <laughs> And at like three in the morning, I woke up to like all these guys talking loudly around the van. I was like, what the fuck is going on? I had to pee. And um, I look out the window and it's just, there's like 30 dudes in Santa suits. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. I peed in a Gatorade bottle and like I got it all over the van. <laughs> and the van just smelled like pee the rest of the tour. And just like dumped it out the door and I went back to sleep. And then I was like, oh my God, guys, like, there's like 30 Santa Clauses outside last night. <laughs> and um, then I saw the flyer. It was like, there was a gay bar and it was uh, Christmas in July. <laughs> so it all made sense. But then, yeah, the next day uh, we went and played the Satyricon in Portland and literally zero people showed up. So it was like that. It was like rolling the dice, you know, to, to see what would happen. But um, the most important thing that happened on that first tour was uh, we were supposed to play Dallas, Texas. and. Um, we, we pulled over the day before the show to a payphone and like tried to advance the show. And I, we called the bar and said we were gonna be there the next day and they had no fucking idea who we were and they said that that place is, they, you know, the, was no longer. And uh, the guy had like gone to jail for selling crack. So we, um, Dan, Dan called Fat Possum in, in uh, Oxford, Mississippi because we had heard they were interested in us and we drove right then to Oxford and they set up a little show for us to play, and uh, and then they gave us a contract that day, and um, started trying to already negotiate down the money of twelve thousand dollars that they were going to give us, 
they were gonna try to give us a 1980 Mercedes with a bullet hole through the windshield <laughs> and knock a couple partial, grand off partial, the contract. Partial trade. <laughs> we were pretty sure that that was where we needed to be, but around that same time, Seymour Stein started coming to shows. So for a while, we were, you know, entertaining the idea of signing to a bigger label, but ultimately, what happened was, um, he was full of shit. He was full of shit. <laughs> and uh, we waited like six weeks for a contract to come. And finally, you know, we were broke 22 year olds in Akron living in a rat infested house. And uh, we were, you know, talking to Seymour Stein on the phone. And be like, if you don't have a contract here by November 15th, we're not going to sign. And of course, November 16th, we, we didn't have it. So we signed to Fat Possum. We just recorded a record that night. And then the next day, put it in a FedEx package and send it off. Could we revisit the Santa Claus thing for a second? I, I, I revisit it a lot, yeah. I, one of my favorite parts in the doc is you literally describing the exits on the highways of the motels and how like it would go down from like hotel and each stop would be, oh, yeah. you know, not as nice. Can you tell me about like, what's a memory of like the grossest situation you guys ever had to stay in? Well, yeah, you know, when you tour a lot, you start realizing, you start, you know, recognizing patterns. And so there's like the Dante's Inferno of cities. And we, we knew like where our threshold was, but you know, so basically like, the first time we came to South by Southwest in 2003, we couldn't, or to, yeah, 2003, we couldn't afford to stay in town. So that, the other day we drove past the hotel we stayed at, which was like five miles out of town. And it was a La Quinta, which at the time was super nice for us. And, um, but anyway, um, yeah, we we started realizing that like you have to get to like the fifth exit away from the city to get to the like the Goldilocks zone where it's like cheap but not scary. <laughs> and if you go past it, then you're you know playing with fire. And we've def but you know we learned that from playing with fire. And the scariest place that we ever stayed was a couple exits outside of Indianapolis in the winter of 2003, and uh, it was like a, a, yeah, like a horror movie. <laughs> like the door didn't lock, the wind was blowing, it kept blowing it open, and there was just, the, I got into the bed and the sheet, like the, the fitted sheet had come up and there was just blood all over the mattress. <laughs> yeah, but. I, No, we don't. But I, I do have a good story that's not mine. It was like, it was a musician story that I think deserves to be told at the South by Southwest keynote. Please. Um, <clears throat> this is actually Michelle's friend's story, my wife's friend's story. Yeah, he had brought a girl back to, this guy had brought his girl back to his room and was, they were porking. And he's like, she smells so bad. It's, I, I've got, he, he had to get her out of the room. And then he's like, the smell just wouldn't go away. He's like, maybe it's me, you got a shower. He went to bed and then the next day, um, he found a dead body under the bed. <laughs> maybe we, <laughs> maybe we start talking about the Santa Claus stuff again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, but like jokes aside, Dan, especially, like, you're not really one to, like, look back a lot at this stuff. Like, what was it like to do this documentary, and how did it feel going through it? Oh, pretty uncomfortable most of the time. Squir a lot of squirming. A lot of uncomfortable squirming. Do you remember those commercials from the 80s that, that were, like, PSAs with um, Gary Coleman? And, like, if someone ever makes you feel icky, <laughs> you know, call your parents. There were definitely icky moments watching this. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a scene in the documentary where it's like we're about to play our first arena show in the US and uh, I'm incredibly nervous. And Dan misses sound check intentionally. And um, it's just full coverage of me being a complete bitch. Um, but you know, it had to be in there. The truth had to be told. And I also want to point out for those who haven't seen it, uh, during the scene, Dan is actually like shopping for like incredible denim jackets. You're like in this. Store. I was with Pat's brother. We were at a place in outside of Boston. This this incredible 
uh, vintage uh, collector has this, had this giant warehouse, Bobby from Boston. And we went there and we were just like, it was incredible. I mean, yeah, I think it was kind of worth it at the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was worth it. I mean, I still have the jacket. I, I can't really fit into it anymore, but. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, there's parts in the film where, yeah, it's like, it's crazy to go to watch it because, uh, you know, there's the, the film, they, they found a lot of footage from early and then a ton of footage from, um, like, while the band was blowing up and, uh, you know, going from big theaters to arenas and, um, I mean, that was a whole blur. It was like four years of my life where I just, I mean, I remember a lot, but it was, it was incredibly anxious time for, for me. Uh, you know, because, you know, I never thought it was like, I never thought we were going to be the band that could play Madison Square Garden. It wasn't, I'd never been to an arena concert until we played one. Because um, none of the bands I liked were, were playing there, you know? So I, would, I was going to see shows at like three, 400, 500 seat clubs. And so when we started, like that was, that was like, for me, it was like, oh, if we can get to play a 400 seat, the club, then we have reached the pinnacle. Um, and when that happened, uh, pretty quickly for us, actually, then we got to the theaters, and I just, I didn't think it was in the cards. So yeah, there's there's a lot of like moments, you know, there's footage of us headlining Lollapalooza. And uh, it was weird because we played Lollapalooza a ton of times, maybe five, six times, um, but the stakes were different. You know, it's kind of, it felt, more relaxed when it felt like no one, when, when you felt like no one was really watching and you wish there were more people, but then when the people show up, you don't want to fuck up. You don't want to fuck it up. Um, but yeah, I wish I could go back and like tell myself to take a chill pill. Or just drink less Red Bull. Just less Red Bull. I mean, like, I thought for less, a while. Like, a little less beer, a little less Red Bull. Hmm. My my form of therapy would I think would be better to watch like the most bo like watch John Tesh at Red Rocks on repeat and just realize like horrible music gets consumed by large audiences all the time. You don't have to be that good. Just chill the fuck out. And you know, speaking of this time, you guys were getting so big, and you spent years before this as like a cult band. Critics absolutely loved you. Did you guys have any like hardcore fans who were kind of pissed off about how big you got? Oh yeah, a, a lot of them. Dude, and, after and they let us know online, often. After the documentary, we had did a Q and A on stage, and the, one of the directors was like. Doing the film was great, especially the first third of their career. Their <laughs> music was, uh, um, yeah, our director. <laughs> yeah, our director. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, um, yeah, no, that's a that's a thing. You know, a lot of people like to show that they were into the band first. I mean, I, I definitely am a fan like that when it comes to certain bands. Like, oh, but um, yeah, you know. Uh, <sighs> The trick to uh, the trick for us, I think, to keep the band vital is to uh, you know keep trying new stuff um, and to to embrace the songs that like our hits or whatever you know popular, but um, not be afraid to try new stuff. And before we move on from those early days, I have to ask: it's I don't think it's well known if you haven't seen the doc that like you were a guitarist first. So how did that move happen to the drums? Um, yeah, I got. I mean, I got into music because my friend Steve, who's no longer with us, uh, I was spent the night at his house when I was in sixth grade, and he had um, he had the Clash London Calling poster in his room, and he had a red electric court guitar, and uh, I was like, what? What is all this stuff? He's like, you, I was like, you can just like have a guitar and like rock and roll. He's like, yeah. I think he thought it's like, you know, something was wrong with me. Um, but it never crossed my mind. And he started showing me music, and I was like, 
I guess I could get a guitar too. And he's like, yeah, but then we could start a band. So I got a guitar, I begged my dad for one, and I, that's how I got into music. Um, and I, was, I took lessons, but I, I really wasn't very good. But um, my other friend's dad had a four track recorder and I saw that and I was like, I want that. Because if I have that, then we can make, we can make songs. Um, so anyway, fast forward to like, I'm 15. I lie about my age so I can get a job um, washing dishes. You had to be 16. And so I worked 40 hours a, a, a week um, doing that and uh, saved all my money and bought a four, better four track and a drum set and a bass and all the stuff that you would need to have a band. And my dad let me set it up in his basement. And so I would like invite my friends over, they would ride their bikes over and we would like start a band. But it came in handy because a year later, Dan came to my house and he played guitar better than anybody I knew. And so I just sat down at the drums. So like, you know, it was the drums are punishment for being the worst musician <laughs> in the room. That was the, that was the first time I ever saw a four track, uh, a multi-track recorder. And that was like, that was a, an amazing moment in my life. And just in, for us, it's like, it was almost like that day we kind of both found our calling. You know what I mean? We, Pat introduced me to this world of music that I didn't even know about, you know? And um, it just like opened up so many possibilities for us to be able to do whatever we wanted. And like the freedom we had in the basement with the four track, it was some of the best memories ever, you know? And it's like, we got, we got addicted to that that feeling of just making shit up, recording and making something out of nothing and messing around and yeah, it was the absolute best. Yeah, and it came in handy because um, like four or five years later, Dan had a band, he had a bar band called the Barn Burners and they would play like four or five gigs a week. He, w he was supporting himself, you know, doing a lot of blues covers and some original songs um, around Akron and Cleveland. Yeah, I'd have to do like three hour sets, you know, and I would play anywhere, whatever they would need, a full band or if I'd play solo or just two piece, whatever. So I needed a little demo to give to the club owners to try to get some more gigs. So I ran into him at a record store. This is 2001. And I just, I just bought it like a digital 12 track and was, you know, going to Akron, Uni University of Akron, third year freshman. Um, no, you know, completely depressed. So I, I decided to go like get a thousand dollar credit card from Sam Ash and I bought this thing and figured like maybe I can record bands. And I learned to use this and uh, I ran into Dan and I told him about it and um, he, he said, you should record my band. Um, so we picked a date and came to my, this punk rock house I was living at, and we sat on the front porch waiting for the other two guys in his band to show up, and they blew him off. And after like two hours, he's like, you know, why don't you just play the drums and um, let's record it. So we went downstairs and just, in a couple hours, recorded six songs that I, I had never heard. I hadn't played drums really, except for with him, ever. And um, and I didn't really even understand that drums were to keep time until maybe like <laughs> 10 years ago, truly. <laughs> I, I'm serious. And um, I thought it was more just to decorate the guitar part. Um, and um, I mixed it down and I gave it Dan the CD and I dropped it at his house and uh, he, you know, he called me. I'm, left a message and I called him back and he's like, we should, we should just start a band. Um, and I was like, you sure? You wanna do that with me? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, let's call it the Black Keys. And then, um, you know, we, Dan picked like 15 labels, small little labels and my brother made a little cover for the demo and we sent it out and we heard back from a label here in Austin called Chicken Ranch. Um, they were interested and I'm still in touch with the owner, Mike, and uh, a label out of Bellingham, Washington, Estrus, said that if we drove to Bellingham, Washington from Akron and played a gig, they would come watch us. 
<clears throat> it seemed like kind of a lot, you know, to risk there. Um, and then another label from LA called Alive, which was associated with um, a legendary punk distro company called Bomp, who had actually distroed um, Devo's first seven inch that they self-released. Uh, they told us that they would put a record out. So we, so we, we opted for, uh, for Alive. And um, that's how it all started. Can you guys tell me a little bit about the decision not to have a bass player? Were you ever tempted to get one? And to this day, like, how often are you asked about that? Um, pretty regularly. But um, we, when we started, we had a third person who played Moog synthesizer bass. Our friend Gabe, who we went to school with, was in Pat's grade. And he recorded um, some stuff on the first demo and first album. But he just stopped coming to practice after a while. Yeah, like, he, you know, he was also, like, fourth year freshman at University of Akron. He kept blowing off uh, practice, which I would pick him up for. <laughs> I, like, I was like, what, what, why aren't you coming to practice? He's like, I've got to study for astronomy. <laughs> and I was like, you think you're going to be an astronomer? <laughs> you don't even have a driver's license. So yeah, he stopped showing up and um, we tried to replace him. We, we auditioned a couple people, and it just, um, every time someone else would play with us, it just, it honestly sounded smaller, you know? Uh, we, we were in Akron, so there just wasn't a big pool of people to, to pull from, and we gave up almost instantly looking for someone. Yeah, the, the search lasted about three days. <laughs> and, um, we realized that, uh, you know, we were listening to a lot of music that had no bass players. Uh, a big influence on me was the John Spencer Blues Explosion. And a big influence on Dan was T-Model Ford. And so we were listening to kind of this, a lot of music that had no bass. Um, it, it turns out that bass guitar is our mutual favorite instrument. Um, and we would always overdub the bass, you know, on the recordings. but. Um, it, 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 it's, it seemed to make sense, like, we seemed to kind of realize early on that, like, we weren't going to find a third person who was going to be willing to put up with the amount of bullshit that we were going to be able to put up with. And um, I think that was the smartest decision we've ever made. Yeah, definitely. And I want to skip, like, five years into your career. I think it's 2006. You guys opened for Radiohead. And if you know Radiohead, that was like at a time of in rainbows and they're playing music that could not be like more different than yours. Like what were those crowds like? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it was, um, that was one of the wildest things about making music is when you start realizing, you know, like when, when that people actually like your music. Um, early on, a big supporter of ours was uh, the British disc jockey, John Peel. He used to play us on his show a lot, and in, in a, and he, you know, he started playing us like the, the end of 2002, and um, he, in in the in the, fo in the like the following year, he he had us on his, we did three um, peel sessions in one year, um, and I think it was from that that Tom York heard our music, and and you know I remember like picking up like, Spin magazine or Mojo or something. And, and like Tom York had mentioned that he had been listening to our music and <clears throat> yeah, a few years later, he, they invited us out to open like maybe eight shows. And we had very little interaction with Tom York, but they were all very nice. The one thing he said to us is he, he called us over after the last show and he was drinking a margarita. And he was like, if you two wore stupid fucking outfits, you'd be as big as the White Stripes. <laughs> that was the one thing he's ever said to us. Uh, yeah, I don't even know what to follow with that. That's incredible. I don't know. I mean, I instantly like turned around and bumped into like, you know, the REM guys and we quickly like felt overwhelmed and left. But, but then we realized we couldn't afford drinks still in Manhattan, so I don't know what we did. So you guys had brothers come out, and that was a huge deal, um, especially to your fans. It was just like an incredible moment in time. 
Uh, Dan, I want to talk to you about Tighten Up. Like, it is kind of, in a way, like, your whip it, in a way. Um, how do you feel about that song now? Like, do you enjoy it more? Because I know at first you were kind of wrestling with that. Yeah, we have fun playing it now. It, it, it's grown on us. It, it gave us the icks when we first cut it. It was, it was so poppy. We hadn't done anything like that. You should set it up, though, because it's the, we had made Brothers pretty much on our own. Yeah. Um, at Dan's studio in Akron and at Muscle Shoals. And uh, we, we had sent it off to get mixed to Chad Blake after you know, a whole process of getting the masters to him. And we started getting the mixes back and I was like, this record, this could be something. But I, I was like, there, there might not be a single here. Maybe, maybe we should try to get another song. And so I, I asked um, Danger Mouse, who had pr produced our previous record, if he would do a song with us. So this Tighten Up was the first song that we went into a studio with the intention of writing a song that was catchy and that we realized like that's kind of maybe what you should be trying to do most of the time. <laughs> so that was just the first time and it felt we got a little, you know, Gary Coleman, we got a little icked out and then what happened was we lived with it for a few months and then I was playing Leon Michaels um, from L. Michaels Affair. I was playing him our record and he's like, is that all you got? And I was like, no, we have this other song but we're not gonna put it on the record. And I played him Tighten Up and he just basically looked at me like I was fucking stupid <laughs> and, said, and said, you're fucking stupid <laughs> if you don't put that on your record. So I, I texted Dan, I was like, can we put this on the record? He's like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> and, then, and then what happened was crazy because it came out, the label was like, that will be the first single. And so it was released as a single April 1st and the album came out May 18th and um, no real radio play. And uh, which, you know, we were, we were told pretty quickly, like it's not, you know, it's not gonna get radio play. We, like the radio department had heard back and we were like, that's, that's fine. We've never had a song on the radio anyway. And we went to Europe and toured for a month and we came back and our manager, John Peets at the time, uh, he called us and was like, the song's like number seven on alternative radio. And I was like, what does that mean? He's like, I think, it, I think it's gonna be like a big song for you guys. And um, it was like instant. That happened in mid-July. And then we went and played Lollapalooza a couple weeks later. And I remember walking out on stage, we'd been there plenty of times, playing to like 10, 15, 20,000 people. But th th this time we were, we were playing right before the strokes. And I mean, it was like 60,000 people. And uh, that's, when I, that's when I noticed that things had shifted. And how did you handle like that ickiness you felt and like the fan backlash from that song? I mean, the only ickiness we felt was this, that we, we weren't sure if we had cheated by making something catchy intentionally. Uh, <laughs> because I think we thought like naively that a hit just appears out of the ether, um, not by like making sure every part's catchy. But um, yeah, the fan, I mean, I don't really, I, I don't remember the fan backlash because what I remember was walking into restaurants in New York City that summer and everywhere I went, I heard the album, um, which was really exciting, but also, you know, it like, when you're not used to w winning, like, it can be hard to win. And so I think it took us a little while, it freaked us out for months and to the point where um, we, we ended up you know, canceling a huge Australian tour uh, and just retreating back to the studio, Dan's studio, um, in early 2011. Because I think, I think we were freaked out. And the, the, what we'd always found comfort in was making music. So we just went and made another record that turned out to be bigger <laughs> than the last one. I was gonna say it's not really common like what you guys did, which is usually you make the album and it does well and you tore the shit out of it to the point where you're exhausted. But you went back into the studio and made- Oh, we did, we did that part too. 
Yes. We had toured it to the point where we were exhausted. Yeah. And what was it like with El Camino? Because that, in some ways, that was gigantic. That was even bigger. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that one felt like a, a departure to me because it was our first kind of straightforward rock and roll album. And, um, you know, when we went into the studio with Danger Mouse, he was, he, you know, he, was, he, he said, uh, you guys will probably be doing arenas next time you tour. And you don't really have arena, that many arena sized songs. He's like, you need some faster stuff. So that was like the, an intentional thing that was put forward. And so very quickly we had uh, Lonely Boy and gold on the ceiling. And, and um, I remember, you know, we finished the album in May and we played Bonnaroo that June and, and afterwards, um, you know, I still wasn't sure about the album and I, the, some of the Strokes dudes were over at my house in Nashville and I, they asked to hear it and I played it and um, I think Albert and Fab were like, that song that you just played is a hit song. And I was like, what, that one? And I played it again, it was Lonely Boy, like, yeah, that's a, that's a hit. So that was the first time I thought maybe we had a, another hit song. But I remember when that song came out, we, we, were, we were doing a press tour of Europe that fall. And uh, we, were, we were in London going to Heathrow, Heathrow to fly to like Paris or Milan or something. And uh, I remember the song came out and our manager was like, it's, it's gonna be number one like the first week at Alternative. And um, with, by the time, by the, the next day, we were in Milan and uh, John told us to come down to the lobby, he wanted to tell us something. And he's like, you guys got to offer to headline Coachella. And um, you know, that's another festival we had played a bunch. We, we had even just played it like direct support like to like Paul McCartney and King Leon, but they're like, no, you're gonna headline it and it pays a million dollars. And it was like our biggest paycheck by a long shot. He's like, and this year, it's." It's gonna be two weekends. So like, oh, so we're gonna make $2 million? <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? Because we, we had just toured the whole year for a brother's 120 shows, and I think the total amount of money that we had made doing that many shows was 3.2 million or something. So here we are. Yeah. So that being said, what was like the craziest, most expensive thing you bought when you finally like got there? Divorce. <laughs> part of me, <laughs> part of me was kind of feeling like you would say that. Um, <laughs> both of these albums were obviously so huge, and I want to step into like the fan seat for a second because. You guys have great love songs on there. There's Little Black Submarines, there's Everlasting Light. Why is it that like the lengths, which is years old, still persists, and what is it about that song? Don't know, it's a pretty song. We were doing, we were doing a lot of overdubs when we were in the rubber factory. And um, I don't know, that, one, that, that, one, that was one where we weren't thinking about trying to write a hit. We were just kind of making, that was when we were just making things up for fun and uh, I had just gotten the lap steel and we added some lap steel onto it and it was, sounded pretty in that big empty um, tire factory. We would put the, the amps out in, the, in the, the room across the hall from us and it was just gigantic and we'd just run these cables all over the place and get all these echoey sounds. Yeah, we, made, we, had a, we have an album called Rubber Factory that we made in 2004 and we rented a space in an old, an old uh, you know, in, in Akron, they used to make all the tires, essentially, like Firestone, Goodyear. B this was an old BF Goodrich. We, no, went, this to, old we went to Firestone High School. Yeah. This is an old general tire factory that was just filled up with, like, toxic waste. But the upstairs had, like, this, um, had office space that, that we rented. We rented a corner, and we soon found out that, like, no one else occupied this toxic-ass fucking hellscape um so we we would like string microphone cables all the way down until like there was a conference room that was like very dr strange love-esque and we would we would put a microphone at one end and then an amp like you know it's like 200 feet long and that was our nap that was our reverb for that album but that's the thing is like that that's that's what got, got dan and i into this whole thing was like making our own records you know 
So like, even to this day, we 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 make everything. I mean, we this n most recent record we did travel around just to get out of Nashville, but it's all based around Dan's studio, you know. So like everything, for the most part that we've made has been pretty D DIY, you know. And back then, like <clears throat> the mixing desk that we got, I got it off of eBay. I bought it off of the band Loverboy. And it was such a piece of shit um, that, like, the guy drove it from Red Deer, Alberta, to my house for, like, 75 bucks. And I swear, that's, like, a five-day drive. I swear he did it just because it was, like, he wanted to just torture someone else. <laughs> it weighed, like, 400 pounds. It was so heavy that when we got it into the space, once we finished the album, we just left it there. And then when they tore it down and it became a super fun site, it's still there. Do you guys ever like listen to these records besides when you're like playing concerts, like Thick Freakness, Rubber Factory, even through El Camino? Um, I'll go back and listen before we do a tour, see if they meet us. But I know Dan. Dan does not. Uh, I don't really. Yeah, whenever we have to, whenever we have to play a new song live, yeah, I've got to go listen to it. I have no idea how to play it. Yeah, you know. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to commemorate the anniversary of your feud with Justin Bieber. Um, it's been a little over 10 years. Um, have you guys talked since then? No, I never met the guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was an accidental thing that happened. We had just played the Grammys, which I was so incredibly nervous about. And, uh, and we won, we won three Grammys, and then Dan also won Producer of the Year Grammy. And uh, um, anyway, we're going to our after party. We were staying at the Chateau Marmont, and like a TMZ guy was there. And he just like, you know, put a camera in my face and asked me how I felt about Justin Bieber not winning a Grammy. <laughs> and I was trying to say, like, I would rather have Justin Bieber's money than my Grammys, which I still, still feel that way. Um, but I, I came out maybe a little bit wrong, and uh, <laughs> and then I, I woke up on the way to, or I, I found out on the way to LAX the next morning that Justin Bieber had tweeted that, and this is at the height of like um, anti-bullying, and he was kind of at the forefront of that with like Lady Gaga, and um, yeah, he had tweeted that I needed to be slapped, <laughs> and um, I got. He wasn't wrong. He was not wrong. <laughs> I mean, I think I think he needed to be slapped too, maybe harder. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, that's kind of when I stopped using Twitter <laughs> because I, I started realizing like I was getting such like a thrill, just roasting these losers <laughs> that I knew that that you know. It couldn't be good for me. And this was like years before Twitter sucked even more than it does now. I, yeah, I don't use the thing, I hate it. I wanna talk a little bit about Turn Blue because I feel like Fever and those songs, some of them can be like overlooked. Can you guys talk to me about that moment where you released this record, you felt kind of fried and then a hiatus came about, like what happened with that? Yeah, you know, Turn Blue is the album we made after El Camino. so. We had this crazy, you know, two, three years of 2010, 11, 12, just kind of two big albums back to back. And, it, you know, what happened was uh, we two, when, when El Camino came out, which was December of 2011, I remember getting our route sheet for the next year. And it was like January, mid-January. And it was, and, and the tour ended up ending um, essentially New Year's Eve. We went, we, we went straight through the year with like a few weeks off. But yeah, that New Year's Eve when we got home from, from that show, you know, Dan and his wife at the time decided to separate, like, honestly, like January 3rd. So it was like we basically had just like destroyed our personal lives by touring so hard. And um, we went immediately into the studio in Michigan. And, uh, 
we should have, you know, I, I love Turn Blue. I think it's a great record, but I, it was like, it was a, it was just most shocking looking back that no one around us, friends, management, no one was like, you guys need to chill the fuck out. You don't need to keep going. We felt the opposite. I think we felt like we had worked so hard to get what was, to get this success that we felt like if we stopped, it would go away or something. And then we learned the hard way, like, like you got, you've got to take a break or, you know, you'll burn yourself out. And so we, we made an album and we toured it and by mid 2014, end of 2014, we were both just toast, you know. And so we ended up taking a few years off. We played sh our last show for a while was um, Outside Lands 2015. And then we didn't play another show until 2019. Um, and we we barely communicated like tw for like about two years. We sent a few text messages, a few emails. But um, when we started getting back together and figuring out how to do this in a proper way, it was, there were a lot of conversations about how to avoid that burnout, how to not overextend, but, but also how to do all the creative stuff that we want to do, because that was part of the thing was, you know, Dan, he made a solo record, he made a record with his other band, The Arcs, he produced a ton of shit, he started his own label, there were all these things that he wanted to do, and this, when we were doing the keys, it was just, it was occupying huge blocks of time, so it was like, figuring out how to balance that. So that's, that's actually how we ended up here, South by Southwest, because we, you know, we knew we had the dock, and um, we knew we had an album coming out. So it was like, how do we parlay everything into something that makes sense? And it was like, well, let's, let's play some shows so we can highlight the Easy Eye sound artists. So we're doing a show tonight and a show tomorrow, and we're playing very late just so we can get everybody here. You know, so we've been trying to figure out that balance, how to prioritize all the things we want to do without it just being psycho, uh, heavy hitting touring just to make a bunch of dough. So we have no money right now, which is true, but we're having fun. Can you guys talk about that dark period where you, I mean, when you went dark, not like it was sad, but when you weren't speaking and you sent, I think a text, Dan, you sent a text of like the sky in Akron. What was it that like made you both like decide like, okay, it's time to like get back in the studio? Yeah, Dan was doing, I think he did a show at the Civic Theater or something in Akron, but he, I just got like with no context, just a photo and it was just, I couldn't really tell what it was, but it was like after a second, I was like, oh, it's, gotta be Akron, Ohio sky. Dreary. The most dreary gray. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're in Akron? <laughs> and he's like, yep. <laughs> and then the uh, band was back on. It was the secret code. It was like, it was like the bat signal. And you know, Dan, you've produced like so many awesome records and you've done all these solo projects like Pat was just saying. Do you think ultimately that helped the keys? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the more that Pat and I work with other people, I think the more we grow as musicians and people. And um, that's sort of what we've done on the last couple of records. We, we slowly started to invite uh, different, different musicians or writers into our, into our world. And I feel like we, we've grown from it and we have fun. And, you know, this new album, we collaborated for the first time with Beck, Noel Gallagher, you know, some people that we've been fans of, and but had never thought to like reach out. So I'm 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 happy we're like finally at that place. We can do that. I mean, the album is awesome for anyone who hasn't had the chance, and it will be out soon. Um, but I wanted to ask, like, how did the Beck collab happen? I know you guys have been friends for a while. Like, has he ever given you like great career advice? He always gives great advice, honestly. Um, but. Uh, we, when, we, when we decided we wanted to have some guests, we thought, you know, who's at the top of our list, you know? And Beck was the first person we thought of because, you know, he's, he was an influence before we were even a band, you know? And then on top of it, he brought us out at a very pivotal moment in our career and had us on tour with him. And we got to watch him play Sea Change every night, you know, which was an incredible record. We met Greg Kirsten on that tour. We met all these different people and 
um, we really wanted to work with Beck. So we reached out to him. He came to Nashville. And uh, the, the first day we got together, we, we wrote a song. And it was just like we hit the ground running. And viewing the Black Keys now with all this stuff happening, do you guys view the band still as like the mothership? Like, does this stuff come first? Yeah, absolutely. It's the thing that allows all the other things to happen, you know? Rock duos, like, in history are really tough, you know, famously throughout the years, like Simon and Garfunkel, Loggins and Messina, Sam and Dave, what have you. What is it about you guys that works so well? What happened to Sam and Dave? <laughs> I thought they were cool. I thought they were chill. Okay, fine. Hall, Hall and Oates, for example. They're not, they're not doing well. Okay, okay. We, Dan and I have, uh, we've always had very complimentary taste, I think. You know, we, we're into the same stuff. And, you know, also it seems like the things that, like, I have a deficit at, Dan thrives at, and vice versa. We're, we're a good team, yeah. And you know, obviously, like as you're releasing this album, it's, it's very different from the early days of your career where it was like CDs and then MP3s and now we're at streaming. Um, how do you guys feel about like releasing an album these days and it's kind of lost as an art form, but I still think it's like so important. Yeah, I mean, albums, you know, you know albums are what got us <clears throat> into music, you know, like hearing something like, and a lot of, you know, a lot of unsuccessful albums are what got us into music. Um, it's a weird time because we, when we first started, you know, pre-social media, you know, you could, there's still like a hope that like you could make a record and it happened to us. It, it would get reviewed in Rolling Stone and things would start happening. Um, and now, you know, there's very little music press. It's like, now it's like, you know, we hope some idiot makes a TikTok <laughs> with our song. Um, our whole career is riding on that. <laughs> yeah. So we've been trying to get the dumbest motherfuckers <laughs> to listen to our music so we can get money. <laughs> Do you see any upsides to streaming at all in this era? Do you see any kind of upsides to the era that we're in? I mean, yeah, there's a huge upside, which is you have access to every piece of recorded music for the most part. And whether that pays fairly or not is up to discussion. But I think, you know, it's impressive to have bad taste in music in 2024. <laughs> it's like, really? That's what you're fucking listening to? You can listen to anything. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we were kids, we were held captive by network television and, you know, people would put up with like the worst, like, you know, Bosom Buddies was like, this is a great idea for a show. These two guys found a nice apartment, but you have to be chick to live in the building. So they dress up as chicks, in and out of, it's, it's psychotic. But now you don't have to watch Bosom Buddies. You can watch anything you want. And if you're choosing Bosom Buddies, I actually might want to hang out with you now at this point. Because you've chosen a very fucked up path. So if you come across like a 13 year old kid who mostly just listens to music off TikTok and knows like clips of shows and film, like what would you expose them to? Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, when I was nine, I bought Vanilla Ice's first or only record on <laughs> cassette. Prolific career. Yeah. Um, and my dad just had the most disappointed look in his eye. <laughs> and and then he gave me Frank Zappa's Freak Out. <clears throat> Which has a couple good songs. I'm not big, not that big into it, but it did lead me quickly to Captain Beefheart. So maybe I would give him Captain Beefheart record. Or maybe I'd give him the Vanilla Ice record. Like, I might just be like, let me just give you the worst shit. <laughs> so that everything tastes better afterwards. And Dan, what about you? I 
I don't know. I'd send him a playlist, I don't know. Are there any new acts that are especially playing South By that you guys would check out or that you have checked out? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's so much music, but we, we were gonna go out last night, but we forgot to. <laughs> we, Dan bought a bunch of 45s from a, from a local dealer and we sat around listening to those. And I always wanna ask during these, uh, what's the best thing you guys have eaten here? Like, where do you recommend to eat? We, I mean, where would I eat in Austin, Texas? Yeah. Um, we ate at a place called Justine's last night. That I would recommend. Nice. Yeah. If, you if you have low cholesterol. Should we start talking about UFOs now? Or? Yeah. We got a minute 45 left. We can talk about UAPs. All right, go ahead. No, I don't have anything to say. Well, what can fans expect from the new album? It's going to be out soon, and it's, it's really awesome. Yeah, the new album is called Ohio Players, and um, we made it over the course of the last two years, essentially. And um, like, as Dan said, it was, it's a record where we, we, we chose to collaborate on every song. So there's a lot of stuff we made with Beck. There's some stuff we made with Noel Gallagher. There's um, Juicy J's on the album. Uh, this rapper Lil Noid's on the record. But the most important thing about the album is that we, we, we got, we kind of got out of our comfort zone, and um, we traveled to London, we traveled to L.A., and we we made a point of like having a lot of fun while making it, and I think I think it comes through in the album. Um, and that's all I gotta say. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you.